I thought your insights into the shift in the way the Marine Corps is thinking about training uh, is a really important one, and uh, I think it might lead to some follow-on comments by the gentleman sitting next to you. So where do you see uh, down the road the Marine Corps must be in order to meet this not only the great power competition piece, but also the highly technical aspects that continue to grow and emerge inside the Marine Corps and the Navy. Yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, probably one of the biggest things that we're trying to do is, uh, and uh, excuse me, Major General Mick Ryan from the Australians has kind of put it best. You know, with everything that's going on out there in the world today, uh, we can no longer count on a technological edge. Uh, we certainly can't count on a quantitative edge, but what we're going to be able to count on, and we have to continue to be able to count on, develop at home is an intellectual edge that enables our people to beat anybody, anytime. Make decisions faster, uh, deal with ambiguity, deal with time constraints, uh, and make a decision faster than the enemy, whoever that person is, uh, can make their decision and make it relevant. And one of the ways we're doing that is we realize we have to get out of the industrial age process of training educated Marines, and I think all the services are challenged with this. Uh, something Frederick Taylor came up with uh, many, many years ago, the efficiency expert. Um, it's still with us. We're very much industrial age. Uh, it's efficient for pushing through large numbers. It is not effective for boosting the kind of leaders we need. And it's not just leaders that are actually holding the rank. It's leaders all the way down to our most junior enlisted Marines who are going to be faced with a situation. There's probably going to be some sort of camera, um, cell phone, whatever, nearby, and that young Marine is going to have to make a decision very quickly, and it's going to have enormous impact. How do we make sure our Marines can deal with that type of future? Uh, so that's what we have to do is change the way we train and educate our Marines to enable them to take entire intelligent initiative when it's required. Um, that's the expectation instead of wait to be told what to do with a lot of our, especially with our junior Marines, um, that's the basis for how we train and educate them until they start to be, uh, have more time and experience in the Marine Corps. We've got to change that. Yeah, thanks for that, Bill. I, I think uh, for the other type commanders, that sounds pretty familiar to you. Uh, we know there's cultural and institutional resistance to letting go of something before the new thing is received, and oftentimes that causes us to, causes all of us uh, to, to not, well, we, if we don't take the risk in going there, you end up with what I would describe as a technological debt that you, that you're just buying off, you're just paying off the interest on the, on the loan and you're not really getting at the, the, the meat of it because you can't afford to do both at the same time. But we've also, in the Navy in particular, said, issues uh, in the past by trying to jump too fast to a technology that wasn't ready. So from your perspective, and I'll start, Brian, you, you know we're doing this, but your, your domain has so much to do with the success of this capability down the road. What are you doing with the TICOMs and others to try to uh, make sure the technology is mature enough and safe enough and protected enough in, to be effective? Yeah, so thanks, um, and I appreciate your comments because I, I think they do echo, and they will probably echo across the other um, other TICOMs. Uh, for us, uh, it, we have a, we have a, a couple different avenues that we're, we're tackling, especially when it comes to trying to train. Uh, we have much the same philosophy that technology is only going to get you so far, but it's it's the it's your people that are going to kind of win the win the warfare here. Um, and so we're taking some different tacks at how we, we get after that that piece of it. I think uh, really key to our success um, is our investment so far and where we were heading with re really relevant learning as the Navy's backbone. Um, uh, we have a, a few of our ratings that are already in the pipeline for conversion uh, under the uh, information, uh, Intelligence Specialist 25, uh, for example. Uh, that content has been converted and the first classes are going through uh, that content conversion. Um, we know that we have to get um, training to the tactical edge, that we can't really rely as much across all the spectrums of the, of the various uh, information warfare specialties of schoolhouse, schoolhouse, schoolhouse. It doesn't work. Um, and so uh, we're, we're pushing towards that. Uh, the other thing that we're really stressing with our partners within the Information Warfare Enterprise uh, from the resource sponsor and through the, the PEOs is to change the way that we look at um, uh, the, the Navy training plans and how we produce training materials. We need to virtualize that space. We need to get to uh, reconfigure, reconfigurable, software configurable types of in environments uh, that we can train our, our, um, our sailors on. 
and that includes on the operational systems. What are the difficulties our sailors have? Um, is that when they get to their, their platform, whether it's a float or a shore, um, the system they have is an operational system and there's not a lot of off-band capability for them to train on. So uh, virtualization is a, is a big key to that. Um, you will probably, if some of you go to the Information Warfare Pavilion, you'll see a little bit of that uh, in terms of what we're doing with Kane's training uh, on that side. And, and uh, so sailors can actually dial up the version, hardware and software that they have in a virtual space and train to it. Uh, we're bringing that to the fleet concentration areas. Um, so virtualization is a, is a big key to what we need to do. And lastly, and, and I'll, I'll really give it over because they've gone a lot further than we have, but for IW, we need to bring in live virtual constructive training of the environment. Our challenge is when you think about the cyber, EW, uh, and information operations kind of space, and, and space, uh, literally, um, those high-end capabilities you don't want to necessarily have out in, in the wild. And so getting from the high side where we operate down into a, a training network that is operating at, at a different level has been our, our major hurdle, and we're working through that right now. Yeah, Rich and uh, Bo, you want to comment on that? Uh, sure. Um, thanks, sir. <clears throat> so as uh, the lead TICOM for the surface community, I look at training in, in two lenses. The first one I look at is the individual training, whether that's the individual enlisted or individual officer. And then the second lens is I look at ship and watch team training. Um, you, you kind of you pay for what you value. And if you look at the service community since 2013, we put over $8.3 billion into our training accounts, whether those are individual training accounts or shipboard and strike group uh, level training accounts. Um, the, uh, the surface community, I think, was probably the poster child for very relevant learning. Uh, many of the things that we did back in 2013 and 2014, when we did the restoration of surface enlisted engineering training, when we built the quartermaster training continuum, we didn't know it was that called very really relevant learning uh, back then, but that's exactly what it was. It was to deliver the training that the sailor needs for the tour that that sailor is going to do. Um, and it, it started paying uh, dividends, huge dividends for us, uh, and then it, uh, it really kind of transcended maybe wide and they're on track, and, and that makes a huge difference. Um, if you look at what we've done uh, within SWAS and CSCS since 2013, we've really gone to the surface training advanced virtual environment. We have re-engineered over 70% of our courses under the Ready Relevant Learning uh, construct. Uh, that affects over 114,000 graduates per year. So that's where we're going with our training. The second one is, uh, that I have the lens that I talk about is in the, is in the shipboard watch team training and the strike group training. Uh, in November of 18, we rewrote the Surface Force Readiness Manual, and we wrote, it, we, wrote, we wrote it to the Surface Force Training and Readiness Manual, where we really shifted the focus of how we were training the ships. We took the, we put the big T in ATG, the big training, and a little A assessment in ATG, where we started really focusing on the watch teams. Uh, with the primary goal of giving more time back uh, to the commanding officers. So that after watch team certifications are achieved, the commanding officer actually has some time to focus in on what he or she thinks is, is their shortfalls through the basic phase. But then we even brought it uh, one step further. If you look at what we're doing under uh, our, um, Scott Robinson's leadership at SMITIC, uh with the advanced training, or under Dave uh, Welsh's uh, leadership, Strike Group 15, uh, for the integrated training, um, we have made some significant changes in progress uh, throughout the training continuum. Last thing that I want to talk about is if we're going to train in great power competition, we have to have the training devices that uh, are at the same level. And if you uh, get down to the waterfront down in San Diego and get to our CS trainer, that's the combined integrated air missile defense and ASW trainer, or the on-demand trainers, you will really see where we're taking training to the next level from a technical aspect. Thanks. Yes, sir, that answer applies in naval aviation. It's the same thing. So as you look all the way from 
uh, new guide training. So Sailor goes to A school right now. I mean, in the past, we everything was pretty much classroom. Class would show up. This is the class start date. Everyone would start the class, and then that class would then graduate. You could do that at whatever level you were talking about. So the training, and you know, that system just really wasn't agile, and, uh, and and it didn't involve the technology that we now have available to us. So uh, one of the things we learned through our whole readiness, uh, return to readiness and reformation was, hey, let's, um, we, we saw the value of going to outside industry and saying, hey, we don't have all the answers. Let's uh, take a look at what, what the commercial industry has to provide to us. And so we've taken full advantage of that throughout all of our training. So like I said, one of the things uh, as a sailor shows up to A school, they're going to now uh, find themselves with some VR goggles. And they're going to walk through where you have a virtual instructor, uh, where you can do uh, reps and sets of whatever uh, tech, tech, tactic or maintenance procedure or whatever else you're trying to learn. And you'll be able to do those reps and sets at, at whatever speed you want and, it, and how many you need to do. And so when you pass that curriculum and it's skills-based, you're going to move on to the next task. So, pretty powerful stuff. The other thing we learned is uh, we took some uh, great advantage of the airline industry in, uh, in approaches to safety. So, how we're thinking about safety now, we're, we're bringing that into sailors at A school and then reinforcing it as they go throughout their career. Uh, the other aspect of the squadron, so now we already have our sailors that are out there, they're in our squadrons, they're on our ships is really how do we evolve that uh, into, into that area as well. And so one of the things we've done, we just moved training closer to the flight line. Instead of, you know, squadrons that have to, hey, I have to send somebody off to school for a couple weeks. No, we're going to provide that training right there on the flight line. So you're still being a productive member of the squadron, and uh, but we're going to provide the training there. So a lot of the ready, relevant learning that Rich was just talking about, we're doing um, uh, there as well. Within Sinatra, pilot training, this is probably where we've had the biggest, I'd say, change in the way we, we train. Everything from low-cost trainers to the, to the VR goggles to um, uh, we're doing a project now called Project Avenger that kicks off this summer where we'll have uh, instructors that, that, you know, about five or six instructors with uh, students, about 10 to 12 students, and they're going to go through the entire syllabus uh, of the, the flight uh, training with that same core group. And they'll, walk, and they'll be more scenario-based as opposed to, hey, today we're going to go do ACRO and I'm going to learn how to do a loop. You're going to go through and put it into syllabus-type basis and really excited about its future. And we're teaming real closely with the Air Force in, uh, in the development of that. At Fallon, and that's where really we learn uh, to get good. Fallon's where we get good. And everything from, everybody knows about Top Gun, but our E2 school, our H60 school, our electronic warfare school, um, our integrated air wing training with Strike, and then, of course, we've added a new course, which is Maritime ISR, because of the nature of the way we, we fight. And that, that um, not only is it the schoolhouses and the training that we provide at Fallon, but a lot of it is the ranges. So our challenge right now is making sure as we take this training into the future, it's not just the insertion of the technology, but it's making sure that we can train on, on realistic ranges with the realistic tactics that we have. And, uh, and so that's one of the big pushes you'll see throughout um, uh, this year's budget request uh, is the expansion of the ranges up in Fallon so that we can continue uh, to take advantage of the, the things that this whole panel just talked about. So, Bill, you mentioned in your opening here uh, shifting from an industrial model into something more modern. Uh, and a lot of that is enabled by data. Sure. Uh, I'd like to hear from each of you how you're, let me just go right down the line here, how you're incorporating data into the, the methods by which you train and educate, by methods by which you employ your capabilities in the fleet, and how is that improving, and what can be done, what can folks here from industry take away uh, from the problems you're having where you could see greater capability down the road if if you had a better understanding of the data that, that exists out there for you. So I'll start, Bill, with you. Yes, sir. Uh, I would answer not well. 
and uh, we, that's something we absolutely need to get better at, and we're working on it. Um, all the way from entry level training, to the standpoint of gathering data on them from how they're doing, what they need to do better, um, and how to get after that, um, to the training systems we use, uh, how, how do they contribute to readiness, how are the units actually using them and contributing to readiness, and then in our collective training venues at 29 Palms, uh, we're trying to develop that facility into to enable us to have an NFL like a bay look at absolutely everything an exercise force is doing, play it back to them for after action purposes, but then identify trends and figure out what we need to fix, trace it back to the source and fix the source so we don't continue to make those mistakes. To me, that's the definition of a learning organization. Uh, we do some of that right now, but nowhere near enough, and that's what we're working on, sir. Yeah, great. Right. Yeah, so we, um, we embarked last year on uh, uh, what we call the C5I campaign plan. Um, and it really has involved all the partners up here um, as, we, as we set forth to try to look at equipping issues uh, from a fleet perspective, a float, all the way back to the shore side of the house. Um, we knew we needed to get after data and, uh, and, and harness it in the way that we haven't harnessed it. Uh, we invested uh, through NavWars uh, FRD into a program we call Raven. Um, and uh, that's really close to being operational. But it's now bringing in about 30 different um, data sources into a data lake that we are now using Tableau and some other methodology being able to pull out. Now that was really focused at one area. That was focused at uh, getting our modernization done on time, uh, partnered with, uh, with uh, Rich and his, his efforts on the maintenance side of the house. Uh, the, so ships came out of the, of the, of the maintenance periods um, with the, the best equipment that they could have, their SOTs and servots, their, their, um, their system to system operational tests, and their, and their uh, uh, servots completed. Um, what though that has led to is we have started pulling and unpacking that through this campaign plan, following very much the performed plan uh, methodology that, uh, that all the TICOMs are, are using at various levels. Um, we started being able to though, unpack where we had uh, personnel issues, personnel mismatches in the distribution, and then all the way back to training deficiencies. And so we, um, this idea of using data to get after these kind of equipping things, right, just readiness, and have led us to much more exploration of the, of the area, and we're starting to get down now into the individual um, information warfare specialties and finding where we have deficiencies in the training and the documentation, the manuals, and other things. And so it's leading us down a path that I think was a little bit unexpected, but uh, uh, we're, we're much welcoming it, and it's helping improve ready. Great, great. Rich? So, following 2017, we had a comprehensive review, and we had a second nav readiness review. Uh, and out of that, 111 dis distinct uh, recommendations. Of those 111, 47 applied directly to surface warfare in um, our community. So the question is, how do we know we're getting better? Or how do we, how do we know that we even move the needle at all for all the stuff that uh, we said we were going to do and then all the stuff that we did under the, the whole man training equip uh, domain? So I'll just use a couple of examples of where data is actually informing uh, us and um, in, in how we know that we're getting better or how we know that we've moved the needle or potentially have even moved the needle. Uh, the first one I'll, I'll talk about is the equip side, which you can you can describe whether it's equip, whether it's maintenance, ship depot, whether maintenance, but we do know this. Um, two years ago, uh, in 2018, 25% uh, of our Ari Burke class destroyers, CNO availabilities, finished on time. That meant 75% of them finished late. Um, given that uh, DDGs make up 40% of all of our CMO availabilities, we decided as a Navy and as a community to actually focus in on uh, DDG CMO availabilities. We called it perform the plan surface. Um, the only way that we could get after that was looking at data. Uh, and all the things that we said we were going to do for CMO availabilities, the only way we did and didn't move the needle. Well, looking at all the data, data if you look at the uh, DDG CNO availabilities for 2019, 43% of them finished on time, and right now we're projecting 76% of DDG CNO availabilities will finish on time for year 2020. Uh, that's real data, and we were able to move that data because of the data. Um, how do we know if we're getting better in our Tier 1 and Tier 2 certs? We have 
you know, data that says, hey, for, for you know, it's a zero or one, we're not going to deploy ships if they're not fully certified. We've held to that. But now we're actually tracking what our ships' uh, scores across the OFRP, whether it's in the basic phase, the advanced phase, or the innovative phase, and we're tracking all those certifications. Uh, we're doing the same thing in the, um, uh, in the manning world. Uh, where we started out two years ago and making sure that all our, our FDNF forces were at 9295 and our deploying forces were at 9295, we quickly shifted to ensuring that our forces were at 9295 prior to the start of Comp 2X, and then we shifted and said we're going to make sure that our forces are at 92.95 prior to the beginning of SWAT. And we have the data that now shows that there is a direct correlation to the ships, number one, uh, entering into those uh, advanced and innovative phases with less cash reps and more manning and better performance. Um, so that's where we're going. The last uh, thing that I use for data is one of the things that we said was going to move the needle was the Afloat Bridge Resource Management workshops with post-major command CEO mentors. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I remember when you were vice chief, I sat in your office in March of 2018, and I said, I think that this is really what is going gonna, is gonna to move the needle on the surface force. Um, and, but how do we know? Well, one of them, my safety officer just brought me down a stat, and we've done uh, about uh, 64 flight bridge resource management workshops in the Pacific Fleet. 43 of those have had a post major command CEO mentor. And of those 43 ships, not a single one has had a Class B or Class A mishap since they've done that training. And there's only been one ship that's had a Class Charlie, uh, Class C mishap. That's a fact. Do I, is it causal yet? We don't know. We don't have a large enough data set, but it's all about data, and that's what we're tracking now to see if we're moving the needle. The last point that I'll make is one of the things that we started from the submarine community is that they really focus in on nearness and, and has reps. And they, over the last decade, have shown if their nearness reports go like this, their class alpha and their class bravo mishaps go like this. It's, and that's all data. Where we took their programs, we expanded it, we did it, and we have the exact same curves. And again, it's all based on data. Thanks. I love data. <laughs> it's just awesome. So I got the, I was fortunate that because Secretary Mattis took a look at strike fighter readiness across all the services a couple years ago and said, hey, we got to get after this. That started the whole performance to plan initiative. And what it really was, was an initiative that changed culture and drove results. And the decision making was driven by data. Data driven decision making. It takes away, I think this, I think that, the person with the most stars wins the, okay, you thought that, so this is what we're going to do. Data don't lie. And so then it really gets into, and as we evolved and went through our, our you know, readiness recovery and, and, and developed naval sustainment strategy for aviation, it really got into, okay, data for what purpose, and what are the metrics we are going to measure, and then do those metrics drive the results that we want to achieve? And does it, you know, drive the behaviors that are healthy and, and sustain, if you will, a good ecosystem? So, uh, our, and what you're hearing through all of us is that reliance on the data and data-driven decision-making is because we've embraced this approach. The other thing that it's great for, I think, is the alignment. I send out every week an Airboss report card that says here's where we are for every single type model series of our air, airplanes. And we talk about our manning levels and everything else. And that alignment, because the data don't lie. It has it all the way from the squadron level all the way up to the CNO, can take a look at that data and know exactly where we are. I'll tell you the other thing and what really encourages me isn't just real word looking data. That's just information, that's just a report card of where you are. But the, the, the key, I think, is we, as we start really applying the predictive data, data that's taken a look at history, but also kind of takes a look at the future and says, here's what I predict your readiness is going to be, or your manning is going to be, or your safety is going to be. 
based upon the activities. And that's where we're really finding, at least through that leadership, that alignment of that data we can get in front of uh, a lot of the issues that we're facing. So uh, that is a big piece of our business as TICOMs now, and I don't see that going away anytime soon. I, I see it just continuing to evolve. Great. Well, the panel is about manning, training, and equipping. Um, which I'm going to put you on the spot here. You only get to pick behind one of those three doors. Uh, which, which of those three topics is causing you the greatest amount of continued gray hair growth in, in, uh, as you view the surface community in the future? Where, where is the tension greatest for you? What do you, what do you think I'm going to say? No. All three, of course. Manny. Uh, for me, it, all, it comes down to, we've made incredible progress on the train and the equip side. Um, and I think we have uh, good momentum uh, there. Now, on the, on the train and the equip side, that can be taken away from one year of 10 continual resolutions. So I'm going to be honest about that up front. Uh, it's nothing that I haven't testified in front of the HASC about uh, or with my office calls. Continual resolutions uh, kill any initiative momentum that we make. More importantly, though, it affects the manning side the hardest. Uh, and, and as we look at looking for savings uh, across the portfolio, there's really three places that you can go and get those big numbers. You can go get those big numbers by descoping CNO maintenance availabilities. You can go get those big numbers by reducing steaming days and fuel. And you can get really big numbers when you start talking about reducing the manning on ships and squadrons and submarines. I think that uh, 2017 has shown us that is foolhardy if we go after the manning profile. As a matter of fact, we just spent the last two years increasing the denominator uh, for our bullets authorized for our ships. It does us no good to increase the denominator if we then don't buy to a high enough percentage of the BA so that uh, we are then able to man our ships at 92% fit, 95% fail across the OFRP uh, and not just for deployment. Uh, I think if we do anything less than that, then uh, we're lying to ourselves to say that we've increased manning on board the ships uh, if we just increase the denominator, denominator and then don't buy to that. So that's where I think the biggest tension is going to be. Okay, Brian, how about you? So I would, uh, I would, I, I'm not going to cop out and say all three, but I think the one that causes me the most tension is probably the training piece. I think the training piece is the great denominator or, or equalizer between equipment shortfall and manning shortfalls. Um, we have a lot of technology that's coming uh, in, into our fleet. We also have a lot of technology that's already there. And there's always a tension between how you bridge those gaps, right? Because we have the fleet we have, and there's a new fleet coming, and, and how you bridge those. Um, to be honest, uh, compared to a lot of wishes problems and, 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 uh, and various problems where you've got to get ships to sea, um, I don't own all. I help influence the pieces and parts of the information warfare capability on their platforms, but I don't own that piece. The part that I actually have ownership at AdCon over is Ashore, and, and we are always a little bit behind. I mean, that's the, that's the Navy's manning model, so um, I don't see a lot of great you know, growth in that side. So the piece that I think that's uh, going to help solve that is really getting uh, our, our training better. Um, it's going to take a little bit of technology investment. It's going to take a little people investment. Um, but, but being and getting and using data to get us more uh, into that predictive uh, place where Bullet mentioned is where we need to be. Right now across a lot of the, the IW capabilities, our training tends to be OJT a little ad hoc and we're, we're working on normalizing that across the, our enterprise. Okay. Bullet, you want to comment? Yeah, so um, not to be repetitive, I kind of break it up into short term and long term as far as what's making my head hurt. Uh, on the short term, I'm with uh, Rich. It's Manning. And it's distributable inventory, and it's with trying to um, uh, address that. Real quickly on that, and I'm not going to anchor here, is uh, uh, we've developed an aviation maintenance experience, uh, Amex score, and that is helping us put the right person in the right, you know, with the right skill sets and the right proficiency and really make our detailing smarter. But that's some of the things we're doing to address those near-term, you know, head herder manning issues. In, in the longer term, uh, and, and it's not really so much the equipping, it's the sustainment of the new systems that we're bringing online. So as I look at naval aviation, Ford class aircraft carriers, MQ-25, E-2C to E-2D, unmanned systems with uh, uh, Triton, 
and you know, and I can go on and on of all the capabilities that are coming in within the next decade into naval aviation. So it's not that they're coming in that has me concerned, but it's our ability to be able to sustain them such that those platforms that we train to them, that we man them properly, and that we're able to sustain them from a readiness standpoint. Great. Hey, Bill, I want to turn back to you here. Uh, you have a tendency, I think, where you're working now to look into the future uh, much further in terms of new capabilities, new technology. What do you got to prepare the Marine Corps to do? What disruptive technologies do you see out there that can help you change the way, as you just described earlier, how the Marine Corps has to shift its focus? And you already heard from these three gents that they're in the same position. Do you have any insights you could provide on the technology front that would help us understand where to focus? This sort of goes back to the previous question, but it's data. Uh, one of the challenges we have is uh, in the Marine Corps is we have a lot of folks with very strong opinions that aren't based in fact. And we have to have the ability to show people objectively, no, we're not as ready as you think you are, uh, and here's how we can help you to get better. And so we have to develop that ability um, to show people, gather the appropriate data, and then show people without the ability to argue about it, here you go. This, this is where you currently stand. Because um, one of the challenges I'm concerned about is, is you know, we have a claim for readiness, or how ready we are, uh, and based on things that I see on our training environments, uh, maybe not. We have to be able to prove that one way or another. Sure. Yeah. Do you, do you see this training uh, in the data? Do you have the right tools? Or do you have the right skill sets? Are there areas that you're trying to focus the Marine Corps on to get after um, not only developing the data, but, but, but being able to use that data for predictive analysis and the things that some of the other gents are very much work in progress. Sir. Yeah. Uh, we don't have, we have some talent in that regard. We're looking for more, and especially uh, from industry, how they can help us. Um, but uh, it's very much work in progress. Sir. So I'm going to uh, turn to the audience here and um, look for some folks to step up to the mics if you've got a question. And uh, Okay, great. Brian, I see you talking or walking. Good morning. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Admiral Miller, my question is for you. Um, many people believe that Great Power War is going to bring uh, integrated multi-carrier operations into a much closer focus. Uh, the chances we have to, to practice that generally seem to be whenever we even get two aircraft carriers together um, at one time, or three sometimes. Um, have we put more money against a shore based environment, a virtual environment, or what, ha what have you, where multiple carrier stroke group staffs and airline staffs can come together and think through the first 50 things that will bring off multi carrier operations? Yeah, great question. Um, the way you brought it up, first I'm going to say it's, it happens at different levels. So, what uh, CSG 4 and 15 do as part of the Comp 2 exes, exercises is really competitive exercises, is really work that at a strike group level. We're now taking those into fleet exercises where we're doing, so we're exercising our, our fleet commanders in their C2 of multiple strike groups. At the tactical level, you're absolutely right, most of that only happens by chance whenever we're, we're able to get those forces together. We are doing more of that through simulation. And, uh, and as well, uh, uh, increasing our ability to do that at, at Air Wing Fallon, so that that works together. So I think from a um, uh, concept, we're there. I think we need those more reps and sets, and now to be able to do it holistically from the fleet level, level all the way down to the uh, uh, strike level. But as far as the doctrine that goes behind that, that's pretty firm, and I think we know how to do that. Thanks, sir. Yeah, but uh, to build off Brian's question for, for all of you really is, do we have the environment that allows you to do what you just described uh, well enough across the entire force so you can exercise at the fleet level virtually or in, in some other augmented reality? I think we're getting there. And so we're, we've placed the investments to be able to do that uh, more as we get into the constructive part of LVC, that continues to improve. Uh, do we have it holistically now where his ships and, and my airplanes are seeing the same threat profile at the same time to be able to address it? In some cases, but not to the degree that we really need, but we're on that path. And so that gives me really good hope that, that you know, we're moving in the right direction. 
Well, we, we have to move in that uh, direction because the uh, weapons that we are uh, fielding or going to field within the next five years have now outpaced our ranges. Uh, so we can then not train to uh, the full capability of those weapons because our ranges aren't large enough. So the only way that you can, and I'm talking whether it's SM6, uh, Maritime Strike Tomahawk, Conventional Prompt Strike Tomahawk, Conventional Prompt Strike, or uh, uh, Hypersonics, the only way that you can now do that is through live virtual constructive. Uh, so as we develop those types of systems, we also have to develop the training systems that support uh, us moving forward. You guys, you want to be, you want to come on? I would just say we're, we're still lagging a little bit on the information warfare side to get into the the, the places where they've they've moved forward. Uh, we've on one uh, one aspect uh, in terms of realistic environments and the physical environment, we're well invested there, and that that's working well. Um, but to, like, as I mentioned at the very beginning, integrating some of our capability, which is the high level, into some of the capability that's at the uh, next level down, those are those are places that we're making investments right now and looking to bridge. Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Good morning, gentlemen. Mess Curtis, Arn Hess from OneMef. Uh, so my question is to the whole panel. Uh, it's, so I've read the CPG, I've read the documentation from the CMO in regards to integration, and then coming out of the keynote this morning, they talked specifically about how integration is the only way in order to get after the future fight, uh, and integration between the Marine Corps and the Navy. But when you look at the, the tactical level of the Marine Corps and even the number of fleets within the Navy, we're still operating off of separate and distinct teams and we have come together for maybe one exercise a year and it's generally if that exercise doesn't conflict with a major exercise from the other service. My question to each of you as leaders within your uh, respective areas is what is the Navy and the Marine Corps doing to combine the TEEPs for the Navy and the Marine Corps to get after true integration to ensure that the, when the Marine Corps is on a ship it is integrated into all aspects and when an event happens it's no longer a afterthought. It's a from the jump. We need to integrate across the board, across our teams, in all of our events. Do you want to kick that Yes, thanks, Master Guns. Uh, one of the things that you you all know, and I'm sure everybody on here on the panel in the room here knows that uh, making kind of changes required by the CBG and the things the the CNO put out, um, you don't make that kind of change overnight. Um, the Commandant's scope is over the next 10 years. It's not just the time that he's in service. Um, all his leadership have heard it very very clearly. We're looking for every opportunity we can. Um, we're, we're making the lead turns that will help the entire ship of Marine Corps turn and get more navally integrated. Um, but it's very much, as I've said before, a work in progress. Um, you and I probably won't see the results. They'll kick us out before we actually do. Um, but they're coming soon. Probably in the next three to five years, you're going to see a heck of a lot more integration. Um, the Marines that work for you are going to see a heck of a lot more integration than we've had in the past. Because we've got to break out of the model of the last 16 to 18 years of fighting. Um, and there's, it's not easy to do that. There are a lot of people that are very fixated on that, and uh, as you've seen with force design, the commandant's not afraid to gore sacred cows, and uh, so that's what we need to do. Uh, from my perspective, um, I'm going to start really at the tactical level, uh, where we're, uh, we're making some progress uh, in, in uh, uh, integrating the teams, and that's on the, um, currently on the Baton ARG as it's deployed right now. Uh, a lot of conversations with uh, Lieutenant General Reynolds, the Deputy Combat for Information, uh, with me, and also with uh, uh, Vice Admiral Matt Kohler, who's the uh, N2N6 or equivalent on the OTMAV staff. Um, as we push forward uh, the Baton ARG, um, we Navy leaned in and uh, provided an information warfare commander, kind of the similar construct that we have done uh, at the strike group level, uh, to pilot it to see what we could do. At the same time, with the uh, with the Marine Information Group detachment that's assigned to the MU, um, working with uh, Commander Don Wilson, who's there now, we've integrated the two the teams between the, the MIG detachment and uh, the the ARG um, Information Warfare team uh, in a way that we're now you know figuring out how we work across that space in information warfare. Um, that's a very tactical level thing that we're doing um, as we speak at a kind of a, a higher level, and it's probably one to lead turn uh, to go listen to the uh, the panel that has both Vice Admiral Kohler and I think uh, uh, Lieutenant General Reynolds on, but all the way up to the to the resourcing level where we're looking at JADC2, the Navy Tactical Grid, uh, and how we're going to do information warfare at the operational level, 
within within a mock, for example, and how we might you know blue green that piece of it. So lots going on in our in our space to try to get after exactly what you're saying. Next question. Hi, good morning. Megan Eckstein with USNI News. Uh, Vice Admiral Miller, you mentioned the aviation report card that you have. I wondered if you could give a few examples of uh, specific instances where you were able to take that data you receive and maybe reallocate resources or otherwise make decisions to boost readiness. And then for the other panelists, I wondered if there's any other efforts um, within your communities to try to obtain unit level readiness uh, information up to your level. That way you can make decisions. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Uh, so. Last year I was sitting here, sitting where Brian is, it's where I was sitting last year in this panel, and we were talking about this new thing, Naval Sustainment Strategy, and how we're going to use data and how are we going to um, make change. We talked about culture and how hard it is to change that culture. Today, sitting here on the same panel, uh, we have 340 more aircraft that are flying today that weren't flying a year ago. That's the power of data and data-driven decision-making, and it's making results. So to your question on, on specifically, give you an example. The initial data set came out and said, hey, here's the two levers that you're going to have the quickest results in as you start this readiness push. Uh, one is your AIMDs, your eye-level uh, intermediate maintenance. Um, you need to do improvement there. And the second is you need to improve the manning at your squadrons. Then the data said, so we started off in that direction. We continued that analysis, and the analysis then said, hey, even if you do that, and this was specifically for strike fighters, I said, you are not going to get the 80% mission capable rate in your strike fighters. And that's when we all of a sudden, because of that, made the decision to go ahead and, and, and do um, reform basically across all the tenants of naval aviation through our squadron level, our intermediate level, our depot level, the way we do engineering, um, the way we run operations center now and make decisions. All of that was because of the insights provided to us through data. And the results are we're at 341 Super Hornets and we're at 300 more airplanes, 340 more airplanes flying today than last year. So it really is a, uh, if you will, a, a testament to the, to the power of uh, data-driven decision-making. And then, you know, I'll give you one example. Uh, you know, as we went down the performance plan surface road, uh, we had you know, two key uh, metrics there. The first one is um, ship start the availabilities on time and then availabilities on time. That was number one. And then number two was the, the work that we said we were going to do during the road that we, we do. Um, because I can get every ship out of an availability on time. All I have to do is just descope the work halfway through the availability, right? Uh, in, in, so I'm just going to give, I, I mean, I've got so many, but I'll give you one. Uh, so we do a, a series of uh, readiness evaluations throughout the OFRP cycle. Uh, one of those readiness evaluations is called the TISRA, which is a total ships readiness uh, assessment. And, and that has to happen during the deployment. And it happens prior to package lock. We know, the data shows us, if you don't do the TISRA, you come out of the availability late. You know, it's not rocket science in, in, in a lot of aspects, but we had never looked at that before. We had never actually gone back and said, hey, did Chip A, who came out late, did they do everything that they were supposed to do until we went under this very formal construct of performed a plan? So that's just one example. Yeah. So. Information technology can be a great force multiplier, but it also has risks if one relies on it and it is not available. And what I'd like to hear your views on if a competitor such as the PRC, for example, were to uh, destroy or blind our satellites, uh, interfere through cyber and electronic warfare with our information capabilities, where are we with regard to having the equipment and the training for our forces to continue to be combat effective? So I, let me go, I'll go after that one. Um, I think what makes our Navy the premier Navy in the world is the way that we command and the way that we've commanded over the last 240 years. Um, and it's that singular aspect that gives us an edge uh, in any environment. And, and our embrace of mission command uh, is what makes the United States Navy the premier Navy in the world. So if in a future conflict 
the satellites and the GPS systems and the comm systems are uh, destroyed and no longer available to our commanders, I have every faith that our commanders will bring a fight to the enemy and will win because we practice that every single day. I'd like to tell that also because to me what it comes down to is education. Uh, you've got to get people that intuitively have the ability to make decisions quickly, uh, especially when conditions change, especially when technology you may have gotten relied upon in training doesn't work anymore for whatever reason. Instead of the stunned mother response of what we do now, it's, okay, let's do something different, let's get after it. And it gets inside Boyd's or OODA loop uh, so that we make decisions faster. And that's technology independent. Technology can help us uh, but if we rely on it too much, it becomes a crutch that would probably be taken away from us uh, at the worst possible time. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Jeff is a little bit too many times. I'm just going to pick this up here. Sorry. Um, this is for service boss and air boss. Uh, you know, a big piece of the whole boss. What's that? <laughs> oh, God, yeah. I guess he's the civilian over here. Sorry, air boss. So, um, <clears throat> Anyway, a uh, big part of the return to great power competition seems to be manifesting with increased uh, training and operations uh, in the Arctic. So I was wondering if you guys could talk about, you know, are you having to train your personnel differently to, to go up there? And, you know, are you having to, you know, prepare ships or jets or, or tweak anything in terms of the equipment side, you know, to, to work back in the Arctic when for decades uh, the Navy wasn't really up there? So uh, from the surface perspective, uh, our ships are designed to operate um, in any arena of the world, and that is still true today, uh, as it was back in 1987 when I operated up uh, north of the Arctic Circle uh, on, a, on a ship that was built in the 50s called Charles of, USS Charles of Adams UDG-2. Uh, so our ships are designed, they continue to be designed, we hold those specs uh, to be able to operate in those environments. Uh, but in the same respect, we have to make sure that our, our, our crews are able to operate in those environments. Uh, and uh, we just conducted an exercise last year, last, I think it was November, right? There, there was a little bit, um, I can't remember the name of it. Um, where we, we brought a carrier strike group, uh, the TR carrier strike group, up north and operated um, and uh, to prove that once again we could do it. But not just on the west coast, we also did it on the east coast. Um, uh, Gene Black, when he had uh, Harry S. Truman, uh, when, he, when he did that, um, that split deployment, he, he went out for a couple months, came back. He went up to the high north. Uh, and I've actually got pictures of him on the flight deck uh, where snow is coming down. And those uh, aircraft and those ships perform superbly. Yeah, so, so, Jeff, I think my answer is the same uh, as far as the aircraft goes. No real changes to training. It's really the exposure. And, you know, I keep reminded of, you know, I'm a black carrier stream dynamic force employment. It, it had been a long time since really we've taken carrier carrier strike group and operated in those environments. And so, uh, so that we learned a lot from that. And I think uh, kind of back to the future, we're going to apply that for future as, as we have more opportunities. But our, our equipment, our airplanes, they're, they're there. It's, it's our experience working in those environments and how we fight out of those environments that I think, you know, we're just going to continue to explore. Next question. Sir, uh, Mark Heinrich, former Navy Supply Officer. Uh, question maybe for General Mullen. I've uh, learned that you guys are instrumenting 29 Palms to get more data off of the range. You've got a big investment coming in war gaming at Quantico. It seems like those, be those initiatives could benefit your peers at the table. Maybe OpNav N7 has to work in integrating authoritative databases, but, but do you think that these initiatives in the Marine Corps could help your peers? Uh, actually, in some cases, they're ahead of us. So I'd like to say yes, it could help them, but uh, that's one of the things that I've noticed, both with the Army and the Navy. Um, they're ahead of us to some degree, and it's not just 29 Palms where we need to instrument. We're trying to develop the mobile ability, uh, because maybe that's more important, is to do it at home station, both during the uh, training to get ready for deployment, and then for readiness evaluation exercises in particular, how do we help them instrument so we get more objective in how we evaluate our units. Um, any along those lines, you know, if, if for some reason I was wrong and they're not ahead of us, which I doubt, um, we're willing to help. So, 
uh, Rick Easton retired swell, and this question is mainly for the swell boss, but maybe other panel members will have, uh, have some input as well. I had the great fortune uh, recently to be aboard an Army Bird class destroyer, and during lunch in the wardroom, they described the fact that they were facing 21 different mission areas that they were supposed to be proficient and competent in. And um, I know from interaction when I was on active duty and sense with the submarine force, they often very specifically tailor missions to, to a deployment schedule or deploying ob objectives, which kind of limits perhaps the uh, total number of missions they have. But when it comes to peer competitors, I think the combatant commanders probably have an expectation that we can execute all of them. So um, my question is, is, what are your concerns vis-a-vis -vis this now 21 mission areas that we have, the competency and that we have in them, and perhaps more importantly, what you see as adjustments you might like to make, particularly to the training with the man training equipment? Right. So uh, it's, it's 21, it's 22 if you're a BMD ship, right? Um, so, <clears throat> I have to provide uh, the number of fleet commanders with combat area ships and battle minded crews. That's my job as a TICOM, uh, and, and we're doing that. Um, I had the same, uh, we had the same uh, discussion almost two years ago uh, about, hey, uh, we, do we really have this right? And uh, quite honestly, I got a bunch of uh, captains around the table who had commanded at the 05 and the 06 level, and I said, do we have our training uh, right? And, and, and quite honestly, you know, I said, no, 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 it's great, it's great, it's great. I said, wait a minute. You know, here's all the things that made me upset when I was in command that I did not like. And, and you know, we have the opportunity to change. And that's how we got from the Surface Force Readiness Manual to the Surface Force Training and Readiness Manual. Okay? We were in a, we were in a lockstep uh, way that we trained our crews. But, but we really, I don't think that we were very efficient at, at about it. Only the surface community did we train and certify the most junior and inexperienced crew members uh, in, a, in a mission area. Why? Because all the senior members were on the training teams, right? You remember that, Rick, from your time in. So we, we shifted that paradigm and we flipped it on its head. And that's what I was talking about earlier. We put the big T in ATG training in the little A. So ATG comes on board now as a flow training group. And they don't, they don't come on board with the check, you know, the clipboards and go, you did that wrong, you did that wrong, you did that wrong, and then give it to the crew and go fix yourselves and we'll be back. They come on board and they train. They impose all, they write all the drill sets. They impose all the drills. During that, they train. If a ship shows that, and oh, by, and the training teams, we don't even worry about. So that means you can have the most experienced senior crew members standing watch, because I want to certify that they can fight the ship. Um, we're getting to watch team certification, watch team certification in about 10 or 12 weeks. Then I put a, I think it's a four week CMAV right in the middle of the basic phase, so that we can reset the material readiness of the ship, and during that time, ATG is training the training teams, and when they come out of that, then we certify the training teams. The ships, we've only got 17 ships through this new moniker uh, on both coasts. But the ships are finishing their certifications at about week 18 out of a 24-week avail uh, training availability, 25 weeks if you're a BMD ship. That means we're getting back to the commanding officer anywhere from four to six to eight weeks so they can focus in on what they believe they need to go into the advanced phase of training or the integrated phase of training. So we've already done that. The feedback that we're getting is tremendous from the commanding officers that we that will have really moved the needle. But it goes back to almost one of the very first questions that I asked, what is the data telling us? The data, initially, we don't have it all, is telling us we're, we're in the right direction. And I could add, I want to add just a little bit from the aviation side because it's very similar, whether it's the missions um, or whether it's multi-mission airplanes. I'll tell you, the biggest difference maker is high fidelity simulators. And the fact that we can get reps and sets against and flying the tactics that, that you know, in a simulation environment, um, that where I'm not showing my hand of my tactics, it's gonna, it's what allows us to be good every day, as opposed to just when I have those forces and I can all, all of a sudden get that one, um, you know, training opportunity. We can get those reps and sets, and, and, and that LVC future, that roadmap to LVC, is really going to be a difference maker for us. Already has been. Thanks very much. Roto T 
I'm the older retired independent guy. Question about the data. There's been a lot about data discussed here today. When you look at the sustainment side of the equation, if you look at the painted glass that's important to O, I, D, Navier, D, everywhere, there's Venn diagrams that have a lot of the same things, but then some very nuanced and different things that inform how they behave. We talked about the fact that we're growing our way into the predictive side. What is being done to establish a tighter data governance and some sort of a holistic strategy that ensures that we're not just building data uh, analytic tools that inform one circle or a couple of that Venn diagram? And how are all of them in sync? And how are we going to do that? Yes, yeah, so I pretty much, our governance structure for me is through the Naval Aviation Enterprise. And so that's in conjunction with my Marine Corps counterpart, uh, General Rudder, and Vice Admiral Peters at Nav Air, and we kind of bring that and have those kind of, those exact same kind of questions on, on are we measuring the right stuff? Are our standards, um, you know, interoperable? And then where are there opportunities to maybe evolve into another um, uh, IT system and get rid of that legacy system? And so all those discussions are pretty much part of my NAE drumbeat. Uh, same respect, uh, my governance structure is, uh, we call it the SWE, yeah. which is the Surface Warfare Enterprise. Um, but it kind of going back to the data, the first thing that you have to ensure is you collect it. Uh, so as we look at uh, OFRP, I love the OFRP cycle. Remember, the OFRP cycle is a predictive presence model. It, it, it provides presence. It's not a warfighting model. And the reason why I like it is because uh, I have a maintenance period, and, we, and then we have a basic phase training period, which we do not short. There's many reports that you know we've been shorting the main, the basic phase for our ships. Now, in the last few years, ship gets 24, 25 weeks, they get them all. Uh, and I also have the data that shows that that's the case. And then, um, um, but uh, and then we have the deployment in the sustainment phase, but there's a bunch of requirements for the sustainment phase, because since you mentioned that, you need to maintain uh, your watch teams at a certain level. We weren't actually collecting that data. Uh, and so what we found out is if we actually pulsed a ship and said, hey, is that ship ready to board surge again? We would, we, two years ago, we'd say, well, no. And the reason why it was no is because we weren't collecting the data. Now we are. We actually had to modify our training systems to actually input that data in there so then we can run the reports and do the analysis on it. And now we are doing that. Thank you. Hey, Brian, um, for the last several years, we've talked a lot about uh, the promise of artificial intelligence, machine learning. Uh, and part of that promise was that we, we believe that it would reduce our manpower requirements on large watch floors and persistent ISR, those sorts of things. What's the, what's the truth on the ground? Because your, your community sees this probably more than anybody else right now. Yeah, so I think we're still a little bit nascent in, in bringing all that together. Um, on the intelligence side of our business, um, through a lot of investments at the OSD level and down, there are some things that are, that are out there that are starting to help uh, uh, nug through some of the uh, manually intensive ways of looking at you know large caches of video and other things like that, uh, making improvements there. Um, but I think we're really at the nascent stages of uh, AI machine learning. Um, one area that we have had some really good success, uh, I'm going to bring an oceanography piece, my, my other uh, background. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we thought, uh, as we put uh, ocean gliders out into a plug to go look at the ocean gliders back here. Um, but when we thought about putting them out, we, we thought about about a 10 to 1 ratio of gliders to a, to a pilot, if you will, uh, operating them. Um, with some investments from, from some other folks, um, we were, we've exceeded that. Uh, we are really doing true machine to machine uh, piloting uh, with a human on the loop, uh, letting uh, predictive ocean models and, um, and directions uh, sort those sort through the environment uh, to pilot. So we're kind of leading in that area and doing very well with it. Um, we do have to get better at close. There's a lot of things that we could do um, um, with machine human teaming. It's part of uh, what we're working on with PEOC 4i and a lot of the forward system design. How do we do that better uh, to reduce the amount of human in the loop and, and let the human 
be able to understand the data and make the decisions in a different way and let the machines talk to each other because we're going to have to go there in the future. Great. For sure. Uh, gentlemen, uh, Will McEnany. I'm with the Naval Information Warfare Center Pacific. My question is directed mainly towards an IFI-4 commander, Admiral Brown. Sir, I'm, I'm a long time out from being a repair officer, lock, uh, repair locker officer. But I was wondering what your thoughts are on the requirements for a cyber repair locker capability and what that might look like both on the, um, the layer one, the actual physical layer rerouting. I could reroute power, I could reroute seawater as a repair officer locker, but I could not reroute my cyber connections. What are your thoughts on that for the shipboard and maybe the, uh, the afloat and ashore community as we try to deal with the cyber um, fire, for lack of a better word, and containment to reroute our capability to continue mission. Yeah, I understand. I understand where you're going on that. So I think there's a couple of things unpacked there. Um, number one is um, we are making you know, investments across the Navy, and a lot of it goes into uh, Rich's ships in terms of uh, NAVC and, and NAVWAR working together uh, to try to enumerate and, and understand what our all of our shipboard systems look like and be able to understand that environment um, more holistically. Um, the second thing going on within my organization is really trying to get after how we train ITs, right? Uh, the information technology specialists out there that are in the fleet, they're our largest force. Um, and how we elevate them from the current training level that we're at, which is mainly focused at systems administration, patching, and those kind of basic functions, um, to a level of, of, if you will, damage control or, or defensive cyber operators out there that can really defend the network uh, in a different way than they can today, using tools that are being baked into the, the systems that we're fielding that we don't leverage as, as well as we can. So that's a that's a piece and part of what we're trying to do within the, the TICOM influence. And the, I go back to that training piece, right? We have what we have. Um, but I think uh, if Admiral White was sitting here, you know, who's kind of in charge of kind of the, the dirty side of the things uh, from a Ted Fleet Fleet Cyber Command perspective. He's looking out across it. All the responsibility has uh, from a shore to a flow because of the connection through the DOD information network and what he's charged to do, um, he would be right in line with you. And I think the first thing he would say is understand the systems we have and be able to sense them and, you know, and, and use computers to, to help you manage that and, and the computational capability and then also to retrain our workforce uh, to be those DC men in the future of the defensive cyber as opposed to damage control. Thank you, sir. Tim Flynn, Intel Corporation, uh, former SWO. This is really, uh, I think, a SWO boss and your boss question. Um, I get Manning being your biggest of the main tree and equip challenges right now, but on the equip side, I'm concerned. China, over the last 12 months, received 23 service combatants that can shoot a total of 720 anti-ship missiles. The U.S. Navy, we got nine ships. One of them is a Virginia-class submarine, an LCS, and then uh, seven DDGs, a few in that mix are all Burke, with limited anti-ship missiles. Can you talk about how the equipped side is going to change? And I realize this is also our boss because you're the force multiplier on these 23 combatants. And uh, what we're doing to mitigate that offset? Well. <laughs> You know, we're, we're once again in the great power competition. Um, and so, you know, if we go into a major regional conflict, we're going to go into the fight with what we have. Right? That's all we can do. Uh, so my job is to make sure that that ship is combat ready. We, we, we leave no redundancy at the pier. Uh, that's why we established a uh, goal that we're going to deploy our ships casual free. It was said that we couldn't do it. Right? Now, you know, if you remember back in um, at Rice University in September of 1962, John F. Kennedy said we're going to go to the moon do the other things, not because of reason, because of how. That was a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. Uh, so setting uh, we're going to deploy our ships cast for free was a big, hairy, audacious goal that we achieved it. Uh, we've, we've achieved it numerous times over the last number of years. As a matter of fact, I sent an entire strike group out cast for free, and if we look at uh, the next strike group that's going out, we're probably going to get pretty darn close to it. Right? So why does that matter? Well, 
maybe back after the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 90s, where maybe we didn't have to sail with uh, full redundancy on our ships. The mere fact that the United States Navy and our ally navies woke up in the morning, we had sea control. Just because we woke up, that's not the case in 2020. So, we have to be ready to fight tonight. Uh, I will still put one of our DDGs up against their DDGs in the day of the week and they'll win. I would just add also that we need to be able to add to the fight. Uh, and that's one thing our comrades looking at is how we contribute to that exact fight that you brought up um, to include we're looking at buying naval strike missiles now and to be able to put them on things that don't sink to be able to contribute to that fight. So uh, maybe as a final question, as someone comes to the mic, uh, for, for each of you guys, um, as you think this great power competition, in other words, we've got varsity players to, to go against now, uh, and we have to be ready. Uh, not only on the equipment side that Tim just brought up, those things are in development, they get handed off to you at some point. But we are notorious as an institution for delivering equipment and capability with maybe not the equivalent sense of training to go with it. How do you guys plug into the system, both, both from an industry standpoint but also through the requirements process? How do you plug in to make sure that something's delivered with the appropriate level of training in time so that when it shows up in the fleet, you can employ it? Well, uh, I think we're plugging in through our, well, I'm not going to answer for Bullet, but through the Surface Warfare Enterprise. Uh, so it is an enterprise uh, look at um, not only for the systems that we have today, uh, but the systems that we're acquiring in the future. And so I then hold a resource sponsor, uh, N95 and N96, accountable and responsible for not only programming the new systems, but also programming the training uh, that is required for those new, new systems. I'm going to give you an example of how you can absolutely get it wrong. Uh, back in 2003, when I had command of the Sullivans, um, you know, your generators are controlled by this, um, this piece of equipment called a LOCOP, Local Operating Control Panel. Uh, and uh, an AIT showed up at the pier. The AIT, the AIT team was led by a guy named Chris, and he was going to replace all my LOCOPs with FADAX, Full Authority Digital Control Equipment uh, Consoles. And it's the latest and greatest thing, and we loved it. And I asked Chris, I said, hey, who's going to train my GSEs on how to operate this piece of equipment? Oh, that will happen uh, later in the schoolhouse. Fast forward to 2008, I have command of Gettysburg. Guess who shows up on the pier with my two new FADAX? And I grabbed him and I said, Chris, you lied to me. There is no training for my GSEs. Fast forward to 2012, I take command of SWAS, and I go up to Great Lakes, and we've just assumed responsibility for surface and listed engineering training. There's not a single low cop left in the fleet. Not one. It's all FADAX. Guess what we're training up to in Great Lakes? Low cops. Uh, that's, that's an example of how we get it absolutely wrong, and that's how we're not holding the acquisition community accountable for not only buying the new equipment, but buying the training that goes with it. And I do that now through the suite. Yes. First of all, I'll just, we do it the same way, but I'll tell you, it's critical. Um, the worst thing we can do is all of a sudden do a software upgrade for an aircraft in the fleet and not have that same software in the simulators. So our ability to train with the equipment that we have in realistic environments is key. So how we plug into it is, as the uh, uh, you know community lead, it's, it's we demand it. So, and, and I would rather have, um, if you will, tried, true and tried, um, tested tactics with equipment that I know, and all of a sudden getting something that either I can't maintain, I can't fight with, and so, um, you know, keep that shiny object back at home. So, it's key to how we move forward. We absolutely need to make sure that we're, uh, our maintainers know how to maintain the equipment that we have, our operators know how to employ it effectively, and, and then we have a full system that we can totally integrate. And so my answer would be very similar to the, to the Information Warfare Enterprise. Um, we try to generate on behalf of the fleet the right kind of IW um, uh, needs, if you will, to inform OMNAV. Um, and it goes, it does span uh, both uh, the N2, N6, and the N9. So we do that through our whip process. It's, uh, um, and we have improved that over the last couple of years to get after it. Um, we are tightening the timeline and in, in, in discussion within the Information Warfare Enterprise 
to, to align those things between the resource sponsor, the acquisition, and what's fielded in our training plans. Um, we, have some, we have a ways to go. Probably the most difficult thing for the information warfare side of the business is the technology changes really fast. It's relatively inexpensive, and people can get it, and they can feel it. And, um, and so we see all the time stuff going out to the fleet uh, based on UONs, GONs, and other things that are just outside the normality of our system. Uh, they get to the fleet, they end up being a system uh, generally uh, either in uh, one of their two platforms or, or you know, ashore. Uh, we get one pump from the vendor, a couple guys trained, and then it starts to fall apart. So we are we are going systemically through the information warfare platform as we're defining it uh, with NAVWAR and PEOC4I uh, to be able to, to get to what I would say the discipline of the submarine community and how they treat their internal system. So it's a work in progress, but we have to get there and, and slow down on the ad hoc uh, uh, implementation without some kind of prototype of piloting way back to a program record, so that's what we're working on. Mm -hmm. That was a very similar sir, but uh, I would just say one thing we're experimenting with, because we need to get a lot more agile on the training side. Um, we're calling it training as a service. Uh, we found that whenever we own training systems to support the equipment that we're buying, um, we have a tendency to hang on to it too long. We don't do tech refresh information insurance well enough. Um, so this training as services, the things that we don't absolutely have to own, have somebody provide that service to us. We conduct the training that we need to do with it, and then it's somebody else's headache, uh, especially as technology changes as quickly as it does. Um, it's faster to change a contract than it is to acquire new systems. Yep. All right, last question. Go ahead. Um, gentlemen, thank you for your time. Um, I'm Nicole Magny, former Pentagon uh, civilian, and now work for a cybersecurity company. Um, and I was wondering, um, this is directed at any of you that would like to answer. Um, I would appreciate a comment on Undersecretary Lord's um, CMMC initiative and how you all feel like that might affect the Navy's ability um, to equip at the speed of relevance, um, and also if there's any positives that you think might come out of that. I didn't hear the question. Can you say that one more time? Oh, sure. Sorry. Uh, Under Secretary Lord's um, cybersecurity um, maturation model certification and how that might affect the Navy's ability to equip at the speed of relevance. Well, that sounds like Vice Admiral Brown is going to answer it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you are Vice Admiral Brown. Yeah, 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 you can. <laughs> That's good. Well, I think, uh, well, my. Uh, and it's, it's probably a it would probably be a better, uh, better question for my, my S1 folks, but um, as we look at the policies that are coming down from that level, and we are looking at um, um, how they affect the systems, you know, design, we're, we're incorporating those things. I, I've, cybersecurity is one of those things we have to bake in, you know, at the beginning of a program. We all suffer from built on cybersecurity, and, and we are, in this, in, from the Syscom level uh, to the PEO uh, level, um, we are now starting to bake those things in. Her initiative, I don't think, is, is much far off from the other things we're trying to do under uh, the NIST, you know, trying to implement the NIST standards, the, uh, the risk management framework, and other things. So it's just a natural progression, I think, uh, as we move forward. Um, but it should, it, it should help us as a, as, a, as a Navy, as a DOD, bake in the cybersecurity from the beginning um, so that we're not bolting it on. That helps. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I'd like to uh, thank the panel members for going up here, uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to answer the questions and talk about things that are important to you. I think we kind of circled back uh, kind of the way we began, which is if you're talking about competition and great power competition, speed and smarts matter. And uh, we are not known for being speedy. We got a lot of smart people. And what I think you heard from these gents up here today is that the, the ability for us to speed up both the acquisition process, the requirements process, the delivery of training, uh, and, and the ability to get our people trained to be, effect be effectively able to operate that, that new equipment, which is going to change if we're going to pace the threat, uh, is, is, is critical to the future of the Navy. So, gents, thanks for being here in the audience. Thanks for participating. On behalf of uh, FC International and the U.S. Institute, I'd like to thank Admiral Moran, General Mullen, 
and the Brian Brown and the Rich Brown right. and the Air Boss. Uh, the Tycoms have a very tough job. The lead Tycoms have the additional community lead and culture accountability that is really unparalleled. And uh, we truly appreciate your time and thank you again. Let's give him another hand. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.